uh, you're now being recorded. Um, these recordings of, of Physics 361 are being posted to YouTube. Um, I don't know if you all saw the link, but all of these classes are being recorded and I'm also posting my notes if anybody needs them. So how are you all doing? How was your weekend? Is everybody hanging in there? Yeah, I mean, surviving. What, uh, what's been the hardest part for you about all of this? Busy work. Who's giving you busy work? ROTC. ROTC, oh, so, you know, I remember, uh, so I was in Air Force Junior ROTC in high school, and mm -hmm. there was some joke about, uh, you know, like they, they posted some people's names in the hall, and they said, okay, um, you know, many of you have initialed by your name uh, to, to indicate that you've seen this. I want you to go and erase your initials and then initial your erasure. <laughs> what? It's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. ROTC and some of the liberal arts core classes, well, most of them are, are given out quite a lot of busy work. Mm. That's a shame. I mean, I would think that that many, you know, liberal arts classes would be best able to adapt, adapt to an online format because they emphasize so much writing and, and natural language. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easier to do that than mathematics. Yeah. How's everybody else doing? I'm good. I think the hardest part is, is that um, there's the assumption that because we're all home, we have more time to get things done, or it's perfectly okay to assign more stuff than yeah. was on the syllabus. At least that's what I'm experiencing. I don't know about anyone else, so that, that took a turn that I was not expecting. Oh, no. Um, yeah, I had, so I'm on the board of directors for um, a group that, that puts on concerts, and they're like, yeah, everybody's got so much free time. Let's have a board meeting at, at 3 p.m. And I'm like, I'm teaching. <laughs> I don't know who has free time, but it's certainly not me. Yeah, so speaking of, of workload in this class, um, you're, you're supposed to have an exam on Thursday, right? Yes. So I talked to Jack briefly. Like, like Jack does not seem to be up for more than, like, very brief conversations over text, but I mean he's he's still very very fatigued. And he he said that on Thursday we are doing the nuclear physics class. So Ooh. Thursday will be so your homework that was supposed to be due Wednesday is instead due Friday. You'll have all the the material you need for that homework set after today's class. So after today's class, you can get started on your homework. Um, if you have any homework questions, bring them to class on Thursday. And I will help you with that. Um, other than that, Thursday's class will be kind of a special topics on uh, on nuclear physics. If you want to watch Chernobyl, you can, right? It's a um, you know it's an example of a nuclear reactor that got a little bit happier than it was supposed to. Um, I don't know about your homework right now, Sadre. At this point, I would say, do you have a grader for your class? Like, does someone else? No. Okay. Um, I am uncomfortable grading Jack's homework unless he tells me to. Um, I, what I would say with your homework is just, like, sit on it. Just just keep your homework, and when, when Professor Laiho is, is back to class, he will tell you what to do with it. But I don't want to, like, touch the grades for his class, unless he tells me to. Um, yeah, oh, if you emailed it in, then, yeah, just email it to him, and he'll do with it whatever he's going to do with it. Um, yeah, Chernobyl is a really good show. And, and we, can, we can talk uh, specifically about what happened in that reactor because um well, let me ask you this before we get started like what are things that you all want to know about nuclear physics do 
because if you have any stuff that I may need to go research, I'd like to do that before Thursday. So, okay, so we can talk about nuclear bombs. That's that's like a very exciting topic, and there's cool physics there. How to build a bomb in your garage? That's hard. Um, it turns out all you need are the materials. That I could build a nuclear bomb in my living room, given, um, you know, eight kilograms of plutonium two thirty nine. The trouble is getting eight kilograms of plutonium-239. Our FBI agents are not happy right now. Your FBI agents are... Well, that... Um, so there was a... Uh, one of our graduate students is Brazilian, Ohana Benavides, and she was asked, as part of like some immigration process of coming to the U.S., somebody asked her, like, you know, do you know how a nuclear bomb works? And her response was, well, yeah, it's pretty simple. You want me to explain it to you? Because that's Ohana, and if you know her, that's how she is. And they're like, wait, what? But yeah, it, they're actually not very complicated machines. It's just producing the material that, that is needed to cause a nu nuclear detonation is hard. And we'll talk about that. Uh, yeah, we can talk about fusion reactors, too. That's super exciting. Um, that, that may be, you know, in 100 years, the solution to our, our energy problems. Nuclear medicine is a fascinating topic. Um, my my mother had a bone scan that was a nuclear medicine test. Um, and yeah, the way that works is fascinating. Uh, precise timing. So it turns out the precise timing is necessary if you want a big boom. And if you don't have precise timing, you get only a little boom. <laughs> and by a little boom, I mean you will destroy like a city block rather than a city. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, like if, if, if you're trying to make an optimized nuclear bomb, you do need precise timing. You do need to know something about explosives uh, and, and how um, shock waves proceed through explosive, different material, like types of explosives at different rates um, to make basically the detonator component of a nuclear bomb. But to make a crude nuclear bomb, like the one used at Hiroshima, um, that technique is not that hard. Anything else about nuclear physics people would like to talk about? So we have fusion reactors, um, nuclear bombs, nuclear medicine. How it directly relates to what we're learning right now, if it does. How it directly relates to what you're learning right now, if it does. Um, that's that's a really good point. Some of it does, um, but oddly enough, the and, and there there is a question about nuclear medicine on your homework. Um, that the, where you basically take the stuff from your homework and you use it to estimate the difference between some energy levels. And they never get to the point that that, is, that has a connection to nuclear medicine. Um, but oddly enough, most like nuclear reactor and nuclear bomb physics is surprisingly classical, is surprisingly easy to understand with like physics one and physics two. And some knowledge of heat, which, you know, if you have a machine that's, that's producing three gigawatts of heat, uh, you had probably, you, if you guessed you needed thermodynamics to understand what happens when three gigawatts of heat is being produced in an area the size of this room, then you'd be right. <laughs> How do you build the nuclear engines from Kerbal Space Program? We can talk about um, uh, nuclear rockets. Uh, I think nuclear rockets are, um, that's going to be the next stage in spaceflight. Um, where we're going to, if we really want to go beyond our solar system in any meaningful way, uh, we are going to need to think hard about nuclear rockets. Uh, it, it turns out we kind of know how to do that already. Um, the, the, the problem with nuclear rockets is how do we have a nuclear reactor that we can launch into space and not worry a lot if something goes wrong? Uh, yeah, Matthew, we can talk about that. Uh, what's the difference between naval reactors and those at power stations? Uh, that's a really good question. There are several different um, 
types of reactors that are used in ships and they have some different design constraints. You don't need quite as much power, but you have some other things you need to worry about. We could talk about that. Um, Grant, so it's the similar principle as an ion engine in that you're trying to, um, you know, all a rocket is is something that pushes matter behind you. And, you know, one way to do that with a nuclear reactor would be to generate some huge electrostatic force by, you know, electricity produced from a reactor and do that. But there are other ways to use a reactor more directly. And we can talk about those. So that's what's coming on Thursday. It, it's hopefully going to be a fun class. Um, I will, you know, just, just kind of for, for housekeeping, um, I will, I may come up with a homework assignment for you all or something like that, because like, are we supposed to have homework after this one? Like, do you have a homework assignment that's assigned after the one that's due Friday? Or is this like the latest homework you've got? Okay, then uh, unless I hear from Jack, I may write up like uh, some very short, you know, nuclear physics homework and give it to you all. So let's, uh, well, does anybody have any other questions? Anything else that we should talk about before we dive into what we've been doing in 361? Uh, if you have a question about your homework, uh, yes, you can email me, Daniel. Now, of course, Caitlin, like I'm, you know, this is what I do. This is what I'm for. And when, uh, you know, I, I teaching people physics and, and helping physics students for me is something that I take more seriously than just a thing I get paid to do, right? So this is, you know, this is what I'm, what I'm for. Um, yeah, you can email me questions. Uh, you can also... Um, if you have Discord, there is a Discord server that we set up for Physics 211. If you stand by one moment, I can get you the invite link. Um, how do I do that? Invite people, there it is. So if you are a Discord user, you can join the Physics 211 Discord and poke me there. Yeah, it says tomorrow on the website. That was the original due date. It has been pushed back because of all of the chaos. Uh, it is due on Friday. Uh, one other thing. About, so, so Professor Laiho, in addition to teaching Physics 361, is also the Director of Undergraduate Studies. And there are a couple of changes to the way advising has worked. I know we have some new majors in here. Um, we also have, um, you know, many people are, like Professor Laiho is, is your advisor. So if you have any advising questions for the fall, or, or if Professor Laiho is your advisor, please feel free to contact me. I'm also an advisor for the physics department. So um, just shoot me a message by, by email on Discord, you know, in, in Slack if you're a <laughs> physics 211 instructor, and um, we'll get you advising for the fall. But I, I can take over some of that. You have a question about something in the text. Sure, Issa, what is it? Um, just something that maybe was in... 360, but I didn't take it, so I might not know. It something in the text says when light wave waves undergo total internal reflection at an interface between two media, no sinusoidal wave propagates into the second medium. All energy is reflected. And do you think you could draw a picture of that? Or? Yes, <laughs> yes, I could. Um, does let, let me ask this first. Uh, does anybody else share Issa's query about what that is? Like, because did, did you do total internal reflection even for those who took 360? Other folks? Um, 
and you did it at the end of the year. Okay. Uh, again, this class you know does not have 360 as a prerequisite, so I can certainly talk about that. Um, for whatever reason, this is giving me uh, a new page filled with the same same things that I wrote on the previous page. So this is actually a very good segue into what we what we are about to do. Oh, I know what's going on. Give me one moment. Actually, let me let me just push some buttons on my journal program. I'm sorry, I'm disorganized. I'm, I've been jumping from from one class to the next. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna. We're gonna have to be here. Let's see. Give me one moment. There we are. All right, we're good now. <clears throat> okay, so here is, let, let me give a brief review of some optics stuff. And so suppose that you have uh, a boundary between two different materials. So uh, in particular, imagine that you have a piece here of glass. And up here is air. Um, glass has an index of refraction depending on what, what kind of glass you have of about 1.4. <coughs> and light rays, whether they're passing from air to glass or from glass to air, bend so that they are the angle between um, the light ray and the normal. is going to be steeper in the air than it is in the glass. Um, so one way to, to characterize the motion of these light rays um, is by a, uh, a wave number. So um, in any medium, the formula for the electric field as a function of position and time contains something that may look familiar. Well, actually, I can just write down what it is. Um, that the electric field equals some normalization constant that's also a vector, because it has to carry information about the wave's polarization, um, times e to the i omega t times e to the well, times e to the i wave number dot product position. So you've seen this in one dimension where it's just e to the i k x in quantum mechanics, but if you have something that's, that's free to move in three dimensions like a light wave, we write this as a dot product. Um, and, and K here um, contains info about the direction of travel of the light ray. So this looks like the plane wave you've studied so far, right? Yeah. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that same image. Take 
copy of it. And then scroll down here. So if we have <clears throat> this, um, I can do that, sweet. If we have this, what I want you to imagine, you know, based on what I drew above, is light rays being shot in at steeper and steeper and steeper angles from beneath, from the glass side. So if a ray goes up straight, it will continue straight. If a ray comes in, remember light rays are at more vertical angles in the glass and more horizontal angles in the air. So a light ray going like this, let me switch colors. this will bend here. Another light ray coming in at an even shallower angle will be bent very nearly horizontally. But then one like this, question mark, question mark, question mark, where does that light ray go? And it turns out for all of these, some piece of the light is also reflected back down into the glass. Some of it escapes into the air, and some of it is reflected back down into the glass. But for the orange one, and this is the, the new idea, all light is reflected, right? Because there's no way for it to be transmitted, right? It would have to be bent at some angle. When you do the math, you would discover that the, um, you'd, you'd basically, in, in figuring out the angle of the ray in air, you'd be in a situation, um, well, the formula, Snell's Law, looks like this where in N here is the index of refraction. It's a number that tells you um, basically how much a certain material slows light down. And you might wind up with something like theta one, the one in air, is the inverse sine of a number greater than one, which you can't do, right? So when the question asks about total internal reflection, it's describing this phenomenon. Uh, Charles, do you have a question? Charles? I see you have your mic on and you've raised your hand. Oh, uh, would you like to type your question then? Well, Charles is typing his question. Um, so, Isa, was this the phenomenon that the homework problem was talking about? Yeah, um, it wasn't even in the homework. It was just something uh, in a paragraph that I didn't get. Mm. But that makes a lot more sense. So, there's actually something that I want to continue along this line because it's actually an amazing, perfect segue into what we are talking about here. So... Here we're faced with this problem of imagining trig functions of like the inverse sine of a number greater than one. So what is the sine? So suppose we have 1.2 equals sine theta. Are there any solutions to that equation? Charles, so Charles asks, is the light beam traveling from glass to air just so small we cannot measure it, or is it actually not occurring at all? 
Um, it is not traveling any sort of meaningful distance. We'll actually see what I mean by that in a moment. But there's actually no energy that goes out. That's how we make fiber optic cables. The way we make a fiber optic cable is we shoot light at a shallow angle inside the glass, like this orange ray, and it'll just continue to bounce off of the top and the bottom and the top and the bottom and travel for thousands of miles. So yes, no energy leaks out. Um, so Caitlin says that there are no solutions here. And that's true if you confine yourself to thinking about real angles. There are no real solutions, but there are imaginary ones. Uh, pardon me for three minutes. I need to start the physics clinic. I have to do that every day at 1 p.m. and I have forgotten to do it um, a couple of times. So the virtual physics clinic is running on Zoom these days. And I have to get that going. Jenny gave me her Zoom password, and I'm in charge of that. All right, so we're all good now. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm doing too many things. So this is interesting because what this means is that the orange ray coming out of glass is traveling at an imaginary angle. And that means that other trig functions of that angle might be also imaginary. So if we consider this again, So here's our slab of glass. Now we're going to imagine um, light rays here. So this is a really good segue into what we're talking about next. So I'm glad we're, we're doing this. So this will bend like this. And here, the k vector, the wave vector telling you what direction the thing is going in, K is real there. But if I imagine a ray that is totally internally reflected, so like this one, when you do the equations, when you like calculate what the electric field is on, on one side and the other, and you, you do the trigonometry with these um, imaginary angles, you'll actually get that k here, let's call this direction y, this has an imaginary y component. So what does that even mean for <coughs> to have a, a vector with an imaginary y component. Um, let, me, let me ask the, the class just to kind of take stock. So people who have taken 361, did you do this? Am I saying things that the 361 crowd has, or the 360 crowd has already seen? Or is this new to everybody?
Can anybody give me feedback on that? You didn't have 360. Okay. Um, K was a vector with exclusively real components. Yes. So what does it mean for it to have an imaginary Y component? So that's a new one, right? So remember that the electric field is some amplitude and polarization times, and here I'm going to write these things out separately, e to the minus i omega t e to the i kx times x times e to the i ky times y times e to the i kz times z. So this term that I've written in red is the one that's going to behave strangely. So what do you get? Yes, k is a three, it's a three component vector. It's usually real numbers, but here one of them's imaginary. So yes, k, k is a three component vector um, in three dimensions because k tells you how many wiggles you have per meter, remember, but how many wiggles you have per meter in x, how many wiggles you have per meter in y, and how many wiggles you have per meter in z might be different answers. But what does it mean if um, one of those is imaginary? Yes, you do, James. This is something that we can we can um, mathematics. So yeah, we don't know the physics here, but if we think about what we know about complex numbers, then we can figure it out. It depends on the sign of ky. Okay, so what happens, Matthew? Um, Specifically, suppose ky equals kappa times i. Then e to the i ky times y equals e to the i multiplied by i kappa times y. And what is that going to do? Yeah, exactly, Yanju. This is going to turn into e to the minus kappa y, which is a decaying exponential. So this is why you get total internal reflection, right? Yeah, exactly. So 
let me make a plot now. Um, of so here, the axes are going to be a little bit funny here because I'm going to turn what I've done on its side. I'm going to plot the magnitude of the electric field here. And then on the other axis, I'm going to plot the Y coordinate. So the slab of glass that I've got is here. And actually, I think I want to actually going to make this a 2D plot. Um, no, it won't be that. So we'll just do electric field here, any particular component. So what will happen is uh, you'll get something. Now this is one component. This will oscillate while it's in the medium. And then when it gets to the forbidden region, where it undergoes total internal reflection, it will decay exponentially. So it mimics a finite well? Exactly. So somebody's read ahead in her book, <laughs> right, Isa? So now you see why I wanted to do this, right? So this is oscillatory with k real, and this is a decaying exponential with k imaginary. So the only difference between a wiggling thing and a decaying thing is a factor of i. And yes, Isa has, has gotten it exactly. The reason that I'm spending time on this is because we see this behavior in the next thing we are studying. So is everybody with me so far uh, before I go back and pick up the, um, the Schrodinger equation? Actually, I want to say one more thing about this. Um, uh, the gray, oh, sorry, the gray area is the physical extent of the glass. I want to draw one more of these here. So there's the electric field. Here's Y. And now what I want to, to imagine is two pieces of glass put near each other. So inside the piece of glass, the behavior of the electric field is oscillatory, right? Because K is real. So up, down, up, down. It's kind of a terrible sine wave. Once it reaches the gap, it decays exponentially. And then once it gets to the other piece of glass, it um, begins oscillating again. Down, up, down. So this thing in the middle that I've drawn is called an evanescent wave. Evanescent is an English word that means uh, it's smaller, exactly, because it decayed exponentially in the middle. Uh, good catch. Um, 
it, evanescent means like transient or decaying or short-lived. And what you can do, even though, I mean, this seems weird, right? In the picture that I drew up here, none of the orange light made it out of the glass. But then if I put a second piece of glass very near to the first, there is, even in this region where the wave number is imaginary, there are exponentially decaying electric fields that are getting weaker and weaker here, even on the other side of the glass, that decay exponentially very rapidly. You know, the, the decay length is basically the wavelength of light. But if you put a second piece of glass there, you can pick them up. You can do other things with them. You can measure them. And this is a trick used by um, like very fancy imaging techniques. And Jenny Ross actually does stuff like this. So if you're interested in applications in physics of total internal reflection, go talk to Jenny Ross because she uses this to take some really fancy pictures of things. All right. So now let's apply this to the Schrodinger equation. So where we left le last left off, we had calculated the um, behavior of a particle trapped in an infinite square well. What we'd like to do now is calculate, well, we calculated the behavior of a particle in an infinite square well. And then we talked about this idea of classical turning points. The idea that if I have an oscillating system that depending on how much energy it has, it will never penetrate into regions where its potential energy is greater than its total energy. And we talked about um, you know, comparison of classical and quantum behavior. And we saw that in the quantum world, particles can tunnel past the classical turning points. Might seem familiar to what we just did, right? A particle being able to penetrate a short distance into a region where it's not supposed to be. We reminded ourselves that for a free particle, a free particle, um, there's a relationship between its wave number and its energy, right? And then we said, ah, but now if we have a potential, and that potential is constant, I can move it over to the other side, and my energy now looks like total energy minus potential. And we identified this here as a kinetic energy. And if the potential is greater than the total energy, then that just means kinetic energy is negative. And you might say, Err, kinetic energy being negative, that doesn't make any sense. It's one half mv squared. And then you say, well, wait a minute. If v is imaginary, I can have a uh, negative kinetic energy, right? And we got this expression down here, which I'm going to highlight in a big old box. for the wave number if energy is less than potential energy. So you know how we were just like spending a long time talking about negative wave numbers? Here we go. So we talked about this now. Um, now what I want to do is apply this to a new situation. So here, doop. I'm just going to draw some axes. Nope. There we go. Yeah, that's too big. We'll make this smaller. So here's x. v 
v of x, and we're going to imagine a potential that looks like this. And this will be v naught. So v of x, and we'll actually define um, this to be our origin. So the potential is v naught for x less than 0, or x greater than L. 0 for x between 0 and L. So it's just like the infinite square well, except now the potential is no longer infinite. <coughs> and I want to think about bound states in here. So um, bound states or stationary states of this. So um, what is a physical example of energy wells? So that is, that is a good question. Um, an example that, that people actually sometimes use, and this, there's one in your homework. So yes, energy, an electron cloud in a, let me make a new page just to doodle on for scratch. So for a hydrogen atom, Actually, this is V of R, would look something like, eh, we should draw it that big. I can zoom in so I can draw something neater. Looks like this. With the nucleus at the middle, so this is not the same function that we have here. But but it, it is a physical example of an energy well. But another example is actually in nuclear physics. Um, one way of thinking of um, nuclear decay, for instance, is that you have an atomic nucleus with um, so the atomic nucleus, uh, think of like hundreds of protons and neutrons within um, another collection of four protons and neutrons moving around in them. So that's a hydrogen atom. But for things that undergo alpha decay, an example is polonium-210. Um, I can think of something broadly like this, where, so I'm imagining, um, let me write it here, graph is the potential seen by a cluster of two neutrons plus two protons um, this is a helium nucleus also called an alpha particle inside the polonium-210 nucleus so when these things are very far away they don't see any potential at all
actually. Yes, when they're very far away, they don't see any potential at all. When they are Here we go, using the fat pen. When they're inside the nucleus, yes, the x-axis is distance, the y-axis is potential. I had probably better label my axes. That's position, this is potential. Inside the nucleus, the potential is actually a little bit higher, but if you're slightly outside the nucleus, the potential is very high because of electrostatic repulsion. So this is kind of a weird situation, right? And one way of thinking about um, how the alpha decay of this nucleus works is you have an alpha particle that's trapped in some stationary state oscillating inside this potential, right? So it's you know oscillatory in here. It decays outside and it wiggles back and forth here, right? And but since there is, you know, it can go into the classically forbidden region, um, there's some small leakage of probability amplitude outside this potential well out into this region. So there's some small overlap w of the stationary state of the alpha particle with the outside world, which means over some, some amount of time, it will eventually leak out. And that cluster of four pro or two protons and two neutrons will escape from the polonium nucleus uh, and turn it into some other kind of atom. So that's an example. Um, and these are all like quantum examples. A classical example is just like a skateboarder sliding from side to side and a skateboard ramp. That skateboarder is never going to escape because they're not a, a quantum particle. Does that um, clarify that? Okay. Yeah, that, that helps. Okay. Sorry, I just got a text message from a, a very old friend. We adopted a cat together 16 years ago, and she just texted me to say that they're going to have to amputate one of his legs. So, that's not good news. Anywho. Sorry, I've got to watch all my text stuff because the students are taking an exam in, in 212, and there may be some catastrophe that happens. So let's figure out the stationary states of this infinite potential well. So what we know, going back to the Schrodinger equation, let's see, h bar squared over 2m, second derivative of psi plus, well, and we'll write Actually, the potential term over here, u of x psi of x plus e of x psi, e psi. I think I may have a minus sign off. Let me check. So we're going back up here. Yes, e minus u over there. That's right. Of course, it's e minus u. So this is E minus U of X times Psi of X. So the problem here is we know the solutions for E minus U constant those solutions are psi of x is a e to 
to the ikx with um, k equals square root 2e m e minus u over h bar and note that this is oscillatory if e greater than u and k real it's uh, an exponential if e less than u k imaginary. So you're probably starting to see why we did all that stuff with total internal reflection, right? Yeah, he'll be okay. One of my other friends in Syracuse, uh, somebody who was actually a physics 211 coach for a long time, um, she's now an environmental engineer in the area, and she and her boyfriend uh, have adopted a completely trouble tripod cat. Like, she's the best cat ever. You know, they're complaining about how they have nowhere to sleep on their bed because the, uh, the cat is, like, constantly taking up the whole bed. So kitties do surprisingly well with only three legs. Just going to go over the sidebar here. So what we want to do is we know the solution in... regions where the potential is constant. So what I'm going to do, color, I'm going to divide the area in this problem into three regions. We'll call them A. It's eh, not the best idea. We'll call it 1, region 2, and region 3. So in this problem, our potential is piecewise constant. our solution will be piecewise um, uh, how, how should I say this? Uh, the solution in each region is as above, so we're going to make the overall solution by stitching together three copies of the above. Um, as one note, so I can have waves that travel. So this plane wave that I have written up here, um, so as a note, e to the ikx is a plane wave going to the right. So the real solution, I shouldn't say real, that implies something about, you know, not complex, but the the full solution in each area is psi 
i of x equals a e to the i k x plus b e to the minus i k x. So all I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, write down formulas in each region and then figure out what A and B are in each region to match the boundary conditions. So uh, I'm going to copy this figure just because I'll need it on the next, uh, next page. So you, I would like to copy. Paste arg. Sorry. Copy and paste. There we go. So I'm just going to write down those expressions in each region. So in region one. I know psi 1 is a e oops there we are e to the actually I'm going to introduce a new lo new notation here um, k is the real wave number inside region 2, kappa is the imaginary number in regions 1 and 3. So in region 1, this is I kappa x plus b e to the minus i kappa x. Keep in mind here that kappa is an imaginary number. Psi 2 of x is c e to the i k x plus d e to the minus i k x. And then finally in region 3, psi 3 is e to the i kappa x plus f e to the minus i kappa x. So now we've got six unknown constants. We don't know a, b, c, d, e, or f. And we also don't know the allowed versions of energy. Actually, so we don't get confused, um, I'm going to skip the letter E because that one is energy. And now what we need to do is apply the boundary conditions. So we know that psi of x must go to 0 as x goes to plus or minus infinity. So what does that do? I'd like to ask to kind of pause and pull you all for a minute. Um, what constraints does that put on psi of x? Are there any of those constants a, b, C, D, F, and G that have got to be zero because of it.
So D here just governs um, region two. So in region two, these are just the, the oscillatory behaviors in region two. They don't touch plus and minus infinity. Uh, Matthew has said that B and um, F have got to vanish. Yeah, because if, if actually you're off by a minus sign, um, Matthew. So let me actually redo this in a way that makes something clearer. Um, I'm going to redefine kappa and change some minus signs just to make this easier to think about. I'm sorry, I haven't taught this material before, so I chose a notation that was, was a little bit um, unfortunate. So here, k equals square root of 2me over h bar. But kappa here is, so here I'm going to put a factor of i in the definition of kappa. Um, kappa is, ah, what's going on? Sorry, my touch screen is being a little weird. Kappa is... imaginary part of psi or of k outside the well and we're going to define it as kappa equals um, the square root of 2m v naught minus e over h bar. This way, kappa is a real coefficient. And that way, yeah, exactly, Matthew, because, because you know, we messed up like, like canceling factors of i. So that way, uh, now, um, these factors of i that I had written are not there. And now it's very clear to see um, which terms are growing exponentially and which terms are shrinking exponentially. Right, sorry about that. Should it be h bar squared? Did I drop an, an h bar square again? It, it's kind of, so in, yeah. So in the units that uh, particle physicists prefer to use, h bar is just one. So it's not uncommon for those of us who are or have been particle physicists who are teaching this to mess up factors of h bar. Thank you. So anyway, <laughs> fixing all of my mistakes. Thank you, Yanju. Thank you, Eva. Um, in region one, we know that psi has got to grow exponentially right, because it cannot blow up as we go to infinity. So that means that that has got to be zero. And likewise in region three, this has got to decay exponentially as we leave the region where I'm classically allowed to be. So that means that F has got to be zero in the, like the new way I have defined my things. Um, yeah, it would be A and G in my original notation, Matthew, but, but since I changed my notation of what kappa means, um, those are the ones who cancel. So I've gotten two of them out of the way. But the next thing that I have to do, and we may actually pick this up on Thursday. I'm a little bit behind where I, I was planning on being, which is fine because um, we did the total internal reflection stuff, this means that we also um, we have five more constraints. One of those is
the continuity condition for the derivative of psi. That gives us two constraints. The second one is that um, psi itself must be continuous at the boundaries. And the last one is normalization. That the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the wave function squared must be 1. So notice that I've got five constraints and only four unknowns. So what does that mean? If I have this thing being over constrained, um, five constraints and four equations, what happens? Well, the trick is that I really have five unknowns. So I've crossed out B and F, A, C, D, G are the coefficients. And the energies E. So next time, what we will do, um, and this is in your book. I may like not go through all of the derivations. We may do some, you know, more interesting things. Um, when we pick this back up, um, we'll still do the fun nuclear physics stuff on Thursday, regardless. But um, You can solve this for the coefficients and also get a formula that tells you what energies are allowed. Because you know, if I've got if I've got five constraints, I can constrain five different things. Um, it turns out that there is no way to um, to like write down a formula for the allowed energies, right? But um, you can get a, a basically an equation and say the allowed energies are the ones that solve it. Uh, I just looked at some notes. Um, it's like it's disgusting enough that I don't even want to write it down, actually. But uh, it's in your book. Are there any other questions for me uh, at the end of class? I do want to do a little more algebra on this next time. Anything else anyone wants to ask? Did this broadly make sense in what we were doing here? This idea, because this, this is, this approach of like, I have a potential that is piecewise continuous. Um, I'm going to have wave functions that are exponentially growing and decaying in classically forbidden regions, and then inside this, I'm going to have oscillatory things. Like that is, you'll see that again and again and again. So this is kind of a prototype of problems you'll see a lot of cases of. All right, I will see you all on Thursday. What's the red line? Uh, the red line is psi of x. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, I'll hang around for a few minutes if anybody has any questions. I'm going to end the recording here.